Navegando por internet me encontré con esta noticia. Un joven tiktoker se graba lamiendo una extraña criatura que resultó ser una fragata portuguesa. Si bien en la noticia explica más o menos bien lo que son las fragatas portuguesas, lo peligrosas que pueden llegar a ser y por qué no es recomendable lamer una, omitieron información muy importante y es explicar el por qué a este joven no le pasó nada siendo que lamió un animal que puede llegar a ser mortal. Las fragatas portuguesas no son medusas, son hidrosos. Son individuos que se juntan y forman una colonia, que es lo que nosotros vemos y conocemos como la fragata portuguesa propiamente tal. Se parecen a las medusas porque son parientes, al igual como lo son con las anémonas y con los corales. Todos pertenecen al filo nidaria. Ahora, en la fragata portuguesa podemos identificar tres partes principales. El neumatóforo, los gastrozoides y los dactilozoides. El neumatóforo es esta bolsita que vemos que está llena de aire y que se encarga de la flotabilidad del conjunto. type of bloodwood tree and a very dramatic one at that. They're named bloodwood trees for obvious reasons. Their sap looks like blood. It's not blood. That red color comes from the high amount of tannins in the sap. That's the same thing that's in wine. But it does serve a very similar function to blood. If we cut ourselves and we bleed, coagulants in the blood cause a scab to form which promotes healing of our skin. When you cut open a tree like that, it's also vulnerable to infection. So it's really important that the tree blocks up the wound and promotes healing. And that's what the sap does. If you watch that video to the end, you actually see the flow of sap start to slow down, showing that it's doing its job properly. I'd like to point out that these trees aren't rare either. They're found across Australia and South Africa. They're just usually a bit less dramatic than this. Dogs before and after selective breeding, part three. Oh, I like that fat. It's that face on your face. I work like a dog day and night. Such a prick in the head. <laughs> Not when I spent my entire life loving Jack Bone and I wanted to. Okay, this is not just me. You spend a whole day lying out at the beach, and then you get home and you feel exhausted. Why? I was just laying around. It's because your body was working overtime in three different ways. First, it was protecting itself from UV rays. The sun gives off ultraviolet radiation, and that damages your cells. To repair that damage, your body mounts an immune response, and that process increases blood flow to your skin, which also decreases your core body temperature. And that leads us to number two, thermoregulation. You need to keep your body in homeostasis. It's hot at the beach, but your body needs to be at 37 degrees Celsius in order to do all the things it needs to do. One way to maintain that temperature is sweating, and when you sweat, your metabolic rate increases and you lose water, which leads to more strain, and point number three, dehydration. Lower water levels can make blood harder to circulate, so your heart is actually working harder and beating faster to bring oxygen to your organs, and that makes you tired. So cover up, cool off, and drink water. You've probably picked up on this by now, but one of my biggest pet peeves is when people use science that they don't understand to try to justify their stupidity and hate. And this week I've been told on three separate occasions that homosexuality is wrong because it's unnatural. I'm a biologist, and no it is not. In fact, we've observed homosexual behavior in over 1,500 different animal species. We've seen gay lions and gay dolphins and gay hedgehogs and gay birds and gay fish and even gay insects. In fact, one of our closest living animal relatives, the bonobos, 100% bisexual. Cross the board. 
But the fact of the matter is, we don't have a lot of data on how homosexuality works, especially from like an evolutionary perspective. But we have strong evidence that there's a big genetic component to it. And even without that, a behavior that's this ubiquitous across the animal kingdom is clearly of some great ecological importance. So don't throw around words like unnatural when nature itself is proving you wrong. No es un alien, es el parásito Leucoloridium paradosum que está apoderándose de un indefenso y ya sentenciado caracol. No me van a negar que parecen gomitas y la verdad, ya no quiero. Este es un dibujo de Leucocloridium paradoxum dentro de, pues, el caracol. Estos parásitos son de un grupo llamado trematodos, un tipo de gusano parásito normalmente. Estos gusanos tienen un ciclo de vida muy curiosito. Estos gusanos son parásitos específicos de aves que utilizan a los caracoles para poder llegar hasta las aves. Lo que hacen es que los huevecillos terminan en la vegetación que los caracoles consumen. Los huevos eclosionan y crecen dentro del caracol, moviéndose a sus tentáculos oculares, o a lo que le llamamos antenitas, donde terminan generando movimientos y cambios en la percepción de la luz de los caracoles. O sea, al estar en sus tentáculos oculares o antenitas, el caracol no puede saber exactamente dónde hay luz. Normalmente los caracoles buscan sitios un tanto oscuros para evitar precisamente ser devorados. Pero estos gusanos evitan que el caracol se dé cuenta de que está en un lugar abierto. Eso más el color y el movimiento que hacen, como se ve en el video, termina siendo más fácil para el ave darse cuenta de la existencia del caracol, tragándoselo. A veces completamente, a veces el caracol sobrevive, y ya dentro del ave, este parásito va a madurar y va a poner más huevos, completando así el ciclo después de que el ave, pues, caga, y otro caracol termina comiéndose los huevecillos. Estos gusanos son comunes en Europa y parte de América del Norte, así que no vas a tener la fortuna o desgracia si estás comiendo gomitas de encontrarte alguno en tu patio. Alguien las quiere, yo ya no las quiero.